Section 20 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in December 2010. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Burke Asenwein. Chapter 20 Influencing by Description the groves of eden vanished now so long live in description and look green in song alexander pope windsor forest the moment our discourse rises above the ground line of familiar facts and is inflamed with passion or exalted thought it clothes itself in images a man conversing in earnest if he watch his intellectual processes will find that always a material image, more or less luminous, arises in his mind, contemporaneous with every thought which furnishes the vestment of the thought. This imagery is spontaneous. It is the blending of experience with the present action of the mind. It is proper creation. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Nature like other valuable resources in public speaking description loses its power when carried to an extreme over ornamentation makes the subject ridiculous a dust cloth is a very useful thing but why embroider it whether description shall be restrained within its proper and important limits or be encouraged to run riot is the personal choice that comes before every speaker for man's earliest literary tendency is to depict the nature of description to describe is to call up a picture in the mind of the hearer in talking of description we naturally speak of portraying delineating coloring and all the devices of the picture painter to describe is to visualize hence we must look at description as a pictorial process whether the writer deals with material or with spiritual objects if you were asked to describe the rapid fire gun you might go about it in either of two ways give a cold technical account of its mechanism in whole and in detail or else describe it as a terrible engine of slaughter dwelling upon its effects rather than upon its structure the former of these processes is exposition the latter is true description exposition deals more with the general while description must deal with the particular exposition elucidates ideas description treats of things exposition deals with the abstract description with the concrete exposition is concerned with the internal description with the external exposition is enumerative description literary exposition is intellectual description sensory exposition is impersonal description personal if description is a visualizing process for the hearer it is first of all such for the speaker he cannot describe what he has never seen either physically or in fancy it is this personal quality this question of the personal eye which sees the things later to be described that makes description so interesting in public speak given a speaker of personality and we are interested in his personal view his view adds to the natural interest of the scene and may even be the sole source of that interest to his auditors the seeing eye has been praised in an earlier chapter on subject and preparation and the imagination will be treated in a subsequent one on riding the winged horse but here we must consider the picturing mind the mind that forms the double habit of seeing things clearly for we see more with the mind than we do with the physical eye and then of reimagining these things for the purpose of getting them before the mind's eyes of the hearers no habit is more useful than that of visualizing clearly the object the scene the situation the action the person about to be described unless that primary process is carried out clearly the picture will be blurred for the hearer beholder 
in a work of this nature we are concerned with the rhetorical analysis of description and with its methods only so far as may be needed for the practical purposes of the speaker the following grouping therefore will not be regarded as complete nor will it here be necessary to add more than a word of explanation description for public speakers objects still and in motion scenes still and including action situations preceding change during change and after change actions mental and physical persons internal and external some of the foregoing processes will overlap in certain instances and all are more likely to be found in combination than singly when description is intended solely to give accurate information as to delineate the appearance not the technical construction of the latest zeppelin airship it is called scientific description and is akin to exposition when it is intended to present a free picture for the purpose of making a vivid impression it is called artistic description with both of these the public speaker has to deal but more frequently with the latter form rhetoricians make still further distinctions methods of description in public speaking description should be mainly by suggestion not only because suggestive description is so much more compact and time-saving but because it is so vivid suggestive expressions connote more than they literally say they suggest ideas and pictures to the mind of the hearer which supplement the direct words of the speaker when dickens in his christmas carol says in came mrs fezziwig one vast substantial smile our minds complete the picture so deftly begun a much more effective process than that of a minutely detailed description because it leaves a unified vivid impression and that is what we need here is a present-day bit of suggestion general trinkle was a gnarly oak of a man rough solid and safe you always knew where to find him dickens presents miss peacher as a little pincushion a little housewife a little book a little work-box a little set of tables and weights and measures and a little woman all in one in his knickerbocker's history of new york irving portrays wouter von twiller as a robustious beer-barrel standing on skids whatever forms of description you neglect be sure to master the art of suggestion description may be by a simple hint lowell notes a happy instance of the sort of picturing by intimation when he says of chaucer sometimes he describes amply by the merest hint as where the friar before setting himself down drives away the cat we know without need of more words that he has chosen the snuggest corner description may depict a thing by its effects when the spectator's eye is dazzled and he shades it says mosley in his essays we form the idea of a splendid object when his face turns pale of a horrible one from his quick wonder and admiration we form the idea of great beauty from his silent awe of great majesty brief description may be by epithet blue-eyed white-armed laughter-loving are now conventional compounds but they were fresh enough when homer first conjoined them the centuries have not yet improved upon wheels round brazen eight spoked or shields smooth beautiful brazen well hammered observe the effective use of epithet in will levington comfort's the fighting death when he speaks of soldiers in a philippine skirmish as being leached against a rock description uses figures of speech any advanced rhetoric will discuss their forms and give examples for guidance this matter is most important be assured a brilliant yet carefully restrained figurative style a style marked by brief 
pungent, witty, and humorous comparisons and characterizations is a wonderful resource for all kinds of platform work. Description may be direct. This statement is plain enough without exposition. Use your own judgment as to whether in picturing you had better proceed from a general view to the details, or first give the details and thus build up the general picture, but by all means, be brief. Note the vivid compactness of these delineations from Washington Irving's Knickerbocker. He was a short, square, brawny old gentleman, with a double chin, a mastiff mouth, and a broad copper nose, which was supposed in those days to have acquired its fiery hue from the constant neighborhood of his tobacco pipe. He was exactly five feet six inches in height, and six feet five inches in circumference. His head was a perfect sphere, and of such stupendous dimensions that Dame Nature, with all her sex's ingenuity, would have been puzzled to construct a neck capable of supporting it, wherefore she wisely declined the attempt, and settled it firmly on the top of his backbone, just between the shoulders. His body was of an oblong form, particularly capacious at bottom, which was wisely ordered by Providence, seeing that he was a man of sedentary habits, and very averse to the idle labor of walking. The foregoing is too long for the platform, but it is so good-humored, so full of delightful exaggeration, that it may well serve as a model of humorous character picturing, for here one inevitably sees the inner man in the outer. A direct description for platform use may be made vivid by the sparing use of the historical present. The following dramatic passage, accompanied by the most lively action, has lingered in the mind for thirty years after hearing Dr. T. DeWitt Talmadge lecture on Big Blunders. The crack of the bat sounds clear even today. Get ready the bats and take your positions. Now give us the ball. Too low. Don't strike. Too high. Don't strike. There it comes like lightning. Strike. Away it soars. Higher. Higher. Run. Another base. Faster. Faster. Good. All around at one stroke. Observe the remarkable way in which the lecturer fused speaker, audience, spectators, and players into one excited, ecstatic whole, just as you have found yourself starting forward in the seat at the delivery of the ball with three on and two down in the ninth inning. Notice, too, how, perhaps unconsciously, Talmadge painted the scene in Homer's characteristic style, not as having already happened, but as happening before your eyes. If you have attended many travel talks, you must have been impressed by the painful extremes to which the lecturers go, with a few notable exceptions their language is either over-ornate or crude. If you would learn the power of words to make scenery, yes, even houses palpitate with poetry and human appeal, read Lefcadio Hearn, Robert Louis Stevenson, Pierlotti, and Edmondo de Amicis. Blue distant, a mountain of carven stone appeared before them, the temple lifting to heaven its wilderness of chiseled pinnacles, flying to the sky the golden spray of its decorations. Lefcadio Hearn, Chinese Ghosts. The stars were clear, colored, and jewel-like, but not frosty, a faint silvery vapor stood for the Milky Way. All around me the black fir points stood upright and stock still. By the whiteness of the pack saddle I could see Modestine walking round and round at the length of her tether. I could hear her steadily munching at the sword, but there was not another sound save the indescribable quiet talk of the runnel over the stones. Robert Louis Stevenson, Travels with a Donkey it was full autumn now, late autumn, with the nightfalls gloomy and all things growing dark early in the old cottage, and all the Breton land looking sombre too. The very days seemed but twilight, 
immeasurable clouds slowly passing would suddenly bring darkness at broad noon the wind moaned constantly it was like the sound of a great cathedral organ at a distance but playing profane airs or despairing dirges at other times it would come close to the door and lift up a howl like wild beasts Pialotti, an iceland fisherman i see the great refectory where a battalion might have drilled i see the long tables the five hundred heads bent above the plates the rapid motion of five hundred forks of a thousand hands and sixteen thousand teeth the swarm of servants running here and there called to scolded hurried on every side at once i hear the clatter of dishes the deafening noise the voices choked with food crying out bread bread and i feel once more the formidable appetite the herculean strength of jaw the exuberant life and spirits of those far-off days edmondo de amicis college friends suggestions for the use of description decide on beginning a description what point of view you wish your hearers to take one cannot see either a mountain or a man on all sides at once establish a viewpoint and do not shift without giving notice choose an attitude toward your subject shall it be idealized caricatured ridiculed exaggerated defended or described impartially be sure of your mood too for it will color the subject to be described melancholy will make a rose garden look gray adopt an order in which you will proceed do not shift backward and forward from near to far remote to close in time general to particular large to small important to unimportant concrete to abstract physical to mental but follow your chosen order scattered and shifting observations produce hazy impressions just as a moving camera spoils the time exposure do not go into needless minutiae some details identify a thing with its class while other details differentiate it from its class choose only the significant suggestive characteristics and bring those out with terse vividness learn a lesson from the few strokes used by the poster artist in determining what to describe and what merely to name seek to read the knowledge of your audience the difference to them between the unknown and the known is a vital one also to you relentlessly cut out all ideas and words not necessary to produce the effect you desire each element in a mental picture either helps or hinders be sure they do not hinder for they cannot be passively present in any discourse interruptions of the description to make side remarks are as powerful to destroy unity as are scattered descriptive phrases the only visual impression that can be effective is one that is unified in describing try to call up the emotions you felt when first you saw the scene and then try to reproduce those emotions in your hearers description is primarily emotional in its appeal nothing can be more deadly dull than a cold unemotional outline while nothing leaves a warmer impression than a glowing spirited description give a swift and vivid general view at the close of the portrayal first and final impressions remain the longest the mind may be trained to take in the characteristic points of a subject so as to view in a single scene action experience or character a unified impression of the whole to describe a thing as a whole you must first see it as a whole master that art and you have mastered description to the last degree selections for practice the homes of the people i went to washington the other day and i stood on the capitol hill my heart beat quick as i looked at the towering marble of my country's capital 
and the mist gathered in my eyes as I thought of its tremendous significance, and the armies, and the treasury, and the judges, and the president, and the congress, and the courts, and all that was gathered there. And I felt that the sun in all its course could not look down on a better sight than that majestic home of a republic that had taught the world its best lesson of liberty. And I felt that if honour and wisdom and justice abided therein, the world would at least owe to that great house in which the ark of the covenant of my country is lodged, its final uplifting and its regeneration. Two days afterward I went to visit a friend in the country, a modest man with a quiet country home. It was just a simple, unpretentious house, set about with big trees, encircled in meadow and rich field with the promise of harvest. The fragrance of the pink and hollyhock in the front yard was mingled with the aroma of the orchard and of the gardens, and resonant with the cluck of poultry and the hum of bees. Inside was quiet, cleanliness, thrift and comfort. There was the old clock that had welcomed, in steady measure, every newcomer to the family, that had ticked the solemn requiem of the dead, and had kept company with the watcher at the bedside. There were the big restful beds, and the old open fireplace, and the old family Bible, thumbed with the fingers of hands long since still, and wet with the tears of eyes long since closed, holding the simple annals of the family, and the heart and the conscience of the home. Outside there stood my friend, the master, a simple upright man, with no mortgage on his roof, no lien on his growing crops, master of his land, and master of himself. There was his old father, an aged, trembling man, but happy in the heart and home of his son, and as they started to their home, the hands of the old man went down on the young man's shoulder, laying there the unspeakable blessing of the honoured and grateful father, and ennobling it with the knighthood of the fifth commandment. And as they reached the door, the old mother came with the sunset falling fair on her face, and lighting up her deep, patient eyes, while her lips, trembling with the rich music of her heart, bade her husband and son welcome to their home. Beyond was the housewife, busy with her household cares, clean of heart and conscience, the buckler and helpmeet of her husband. Down the lane came the children, trooping home after the cows, seeking as truant birds do the quiet of their home nest. And I saw the night come down on that house, falling gently as the wings of the unseen dove, and the old man, while a startled bird called from the forest, and the trees were shrill with the cricket's cry, and the stars were swarming in the sky, got the family around him, and, taking the old Bible from the table, called them to their knees, the little baby hiding in the folds of his mother's dress, while he closed the record of that simple day by calling down God's benediction on that family and that home. And while I gazed, the vision of that marble capital faded. Forgotten were its treasures and its majesty, and I said, O oh, surely here in the homes of the people are lodged at last the strength and the responsibility of this government, the hope and the promise of this republic. Henry W. Grady Suggestive Scenes one thing in life calls for another, there is a fitness in events and places. The sight of a pleasant arbor puts it in our mind to sit there. One place suggests work, another idleness, a third early rising and long rambles in the dew. The effect of night, of any flowing water, of lighted cities, of the peep of day, of ships, of the open ocean, calls up in the mind an army of anonymous desires and pleasures. Something we feel should happen, we know not what, yet we proceed in quest of it. And many of the happiest hours in life fleet by us in this vain attendance on the genius of the place and moment. It is thus that tracts of young fir and low rocks that reach into deep soundings particularly delight and torture me. 
something must have happened in such places and perhaps ages back to members of my race and when i was a child i tried to invent appropriate games for them as i still try just as vainly to fit them with the proper story some places speak distinctly certain dank gardens cry aloud for a murder certain old houses demand to be haunted certain coasts are set aside for shipwreck other spots again seem to abide their destiny suggestive and impenetrable miching malecho the inn at burford bridge with its arbors and green garden and silent eddying river though it is known already as the place where keats wrote some of his endymion and nelson parted from his emma still seems to wait the coming of the appropriate legend within these ivied walls behind these old green shutters some further business smoulders waiting for its hour the old hawes inn at the queen's ferry makes a similar call upon my fancy there it stands apart from the town beside the pier in a climate of its own half inland half marine in front the ferry bubbling with the tide and the guardship swinging to her anchor behind the old garden with the trees americans seek it already for the sake of lovell and oldbuck who dined there at the beginning of the antiquary but you need not tell me that is not all there is some story unrecorded or not yet complete which must express the meaning of that inn more fully i have lived both at the halls and burford in a perpetual flutter on the heel as it seemed of some adventure that should justify the place but though the feeling had me to bed at night and called me again at morning in one unbroken round of pleasure and suspense nothing befell me in either worth remark the man or the hour had not yet come but some day i think a boat shall put off from the queen's ferry fraught with a dear cargo and some frosty night a horseman on a tragic errand rattle with his whip upon the green shutters at the inn at burford r l stevenson a gossip on romance from midnight in london clang 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 the fire bells bing 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 the alarm in an instant quiet turns to uproar an outburst of noise excitement clamour bedlam broke loose bing 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 rattle clash and clatter open fly the doors brave men mount their boxes bing 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 they're off the horses tear down the street like mad bing 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 goes the gong get out of the track the engines are coming for god's sake snatch that child from the road on on wildly resolutely madly fly the steeds bing bing the gong away dash the horses on the wings of fevered fury on whirls the machine down streets around corners up this avenue and across that one out into the very bowels of darkness whiffing wheezing shooting a million sparks from the stack paving the path of startled night with a galaxy of stars over the house-tops to the north a volcanic burst of flame shoots out belching with blinding effect the sky is ablaze a tenement house is burning five hundred souls are in peril merciful heaven spare the victims are the engines coming yes here they are dashing down the street look the horses ride upon the wind eyes bulging like balls of fire nostrils wide open a palpitating billow of fire rolling plunging bounding rising falling swelling heaving and with mad passion bursting its red-hot sides asunder reaching out its arms encircling squeezing grabbing up swallowing everything before it with the hot greedy mouth of an appalling monster how the horses dash around the corner animal instinct say you eh more brute reason up the ladders men the towering building is buried in bloated banks of savage biting elements 
forked tongues dart out and in dodge here and there up and down and wind their cutting edges around every object a crash a dull explosive sound and a puff of smoke leaps out at the highest point upon the roof stands a dark figure in a desperate strait the hands making frantic gestures the arms swinging wildly and then the body shoots off into frightful space plunging upon the pavement with a revolting thud the man's arm strikes a bystander as he darts down the crowd shudders sways and utters a low murmur of pity and horror the faint-hearted lookers-on hide their faces one woman swoons away poor fellow dead exclaims a laborer as he looks upon the man's body i joe and i knew him well too he lived next door to me five flights back he leaves a widowed mother and two wee bits of orphans i helped him bury his wife a fortnight ago ah joe but it's hard lines for the orphans a ghastly hour moves on dragging its regiment of panic in its trail and leaving crimson blotches of cruelty along the path of night are they all out firemen aye aye sir no they're not there's a woman in the top window holding a child in her arms over yonder in the right hand corner the ladders there a hundred pounds to the man who makes the rescue a dozen start one man more supple than the others and reckless in his bravery clambers to the top rung of the ladder too short he cries hoist another up it goes he mounts to the window fastens the rope lashes mother and babe swings them off into ugly emptiness and lets them down to be rescued by his comrades bravo fireman shouts the crowd a crash breaks through the uproar of crackling timbers look alive up there great god the roof has fallen the walls sway rock and tumble in with a deafening roar the spectators cease to breathe the cold truth reveals itself the fireman has been carried into the seething furnace an old woman bent with the weight of age rushes through the fire line shrieking raving and wringing her hands and opening her heart of grief poor john he was all i had and a brave lad he was too but he's gone now he lost his own life in saving two more and now now he's there away in there she repeats pointing to the cruel oven the engines do their work the flames die out an eerie gloom hangs over the ruins like a formidable blackened pall and the noon of night is past arden jones foster questions and answers one write two paragraphs on one of these the racehorse the motorboat golfing tennis let the first be pure exposition and the second pure description two select your own theme and do the same in two short extemporaneous speeches three Deliver a short original address in the over-ornamented style. 4. A. Point out its defects. B. Recast it in a more effective style. C. Show how the one surpasses the other. 5. Make a list of ten subjects which lend themselves to description in the style you prefer. 6. Deliver a two-minute speech on any one of them, using chiefly, but not solely, description. 7. For one minute, look at any object, scene, action, picture, or person you choose. Take two minutes to arrange your thoughts, and then deliver a short description, all without making written notes. 8. In what sense is description more personal than exposition? 9. 
explain the difference between a scientific and an artistic description. 10. In the style of Dickens and Irving, write five separate sentences describing five characters by means of suggestion, one sentence to each. 11. Describe a character by means of a hint after the manner of Chaucer. 12. Read aloud the following with special attention to gesture. His very throat was moral. You saw a good deal of it. You looked over a very low fence of white cravat, whereof no man had ever beheld the tie, for he fastened it behind, and there it lay, a valley between two jutting heights of collar, serene and whiskerless before you. It seemed to say, on the part of Mr. Pecksniff, There is no deception, ladies and gentlemen, all is peace, a holy calm pervades me. So did his hair, just grizzled with an iron grey, which was all brushed off his forehead and stood bolt upright, or slightly drooped in kindred action with his heavy eyelids. So did his person, which was sleek, though free from corpulency. So did his manner, which was soft and oily. In a word, even his plain black suit and state of widower and dangling double eyeglass all tended to the same purpose and cried aloud, Behold the moral Pecksniff! Charles Dickens, Martin Chuzzlewit 13. Which of the following do you prefer, and why? She was a blooming lass of fresh eighteen, plump as a partridge, ripe and melting, and rosy-cheeked as one of her father's peaches. Irving She was a splendidly feminine girl, as wholesome as a November pippin, and no more mysterious than a window-pane. O. Henry Small, shining, neat, methodical, and buxom was Miss Peacher, cherry-cheeked and tuneful of voice. Dickens 14. Invent five epithets and apply them as you choose. 15. A. Make a list of five figures of speech. B. Define them. C. Give an example preferably original, under each. 16. Pick out the figures of speech in the address by Grady. 17. Invent an original figure to take the place of any one in Grady's speech. 18. What sort of figures do you find in the selection from Stevenson? 19. What methods of description does he seem to prefer? 20. Write and deliver, without notes and with descriptive gestures, a description in imitation of any of the authors quoted in this chapter. 21. Re-examine one of your past speeches and improve the descriptive work. Report on what faults you found to exist. 22. Deliver an extemporaneous speech describing any dramatic scene in the style of Midnight in London. 23. Describe an event in your favorite sport in the style of Dr. Talmadge. Be careful to make the delivery effective. 24. Criticize, favorably or unfavorably, the descriptions of any travel talk you may have heard recently. 25. Deliver a brief original travel talk, as though you were showing pictures. 26. Recast the talk and deliver it without pictures. End of section 20. Section 21 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avayi in December 2010. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Burke Eisenwein. Chapter 21 Influencing by Narration. The art of narration is the art of writing in hooks and eyes. The principle consists in making the appropriate thought follow the appropriate thought, the proper fact, the proper fact, in first preparing the mind for what is to come, and then letting it come. Walter Bacot, Literary Studies Our very speech is curiously historical. Most men, you may observe, speak only to narrate, not in imparting what they have thought, which indeed were often a very small matter, but in exhibiting what they have undergone or seen, which is a quite unlimited one, do talkers dilate. Cut us off from narrative, how would the stream of conversation, even among the wisest, languish into detached handfuls, and among the foolish utterly evaporate thus as we do nothing but enact history we say little but recite it thomas carlyle on history only a small segment of the great field of narration offers its resources to the public speaker and that includes the anecdote biographical facts and the narration of events in general narration more easily defined than mastered, is the recital of an incident or a group of facts and occurrences in such a manner as to produce a desired effect. The laws of narration are few, but its successful practice involves more of art than would at first appear, so much indeed that we cannot even touch upon its technique here, but must content ourselves with an examination of a few examples of narration as used in public speech. In a preliminary way, notice how radically the public speaker's use of narrative differs from that of the story writer, in the more limited scope, absence of extended dialogue and character drawing, and freedom from elaboration of detail, which characterize platform narrative. On the other hand, there are several similarities of method. The frequent combination of narration with exposition, description, argumentation, and pleading, the care exercised in the arrangement of material so as to produce a strong effect at the close, climax, the very general practice of concealing the point, the nument of a story until the effective moment, and the careful suppression of needless and therefore hurtful details. So we see that, whether for magazine or platform, the art of narration involves far more than the recital of annals. The succession of events recorded requires a plan in order to bring them out with real effect. It will be noticed, too, that the literary style in platform narration is likely to be either less polished and more vigorously dramatic than in that intended for publication, or else more fervid and elevated in tone. In this latter respect, however, the best platform speaking of today differs from the models of the preceding generation wherein a highly dignified and sometimes pompous style was thought the only fitting dress for a public deliverance. Great, noble, and stirring as these older masters were in their lofty and impassionate eloquence, we are sometimes oppressed when we read their sounding periods for any great length of time, even allowing for all that we lose by missing the speaker's presence, voice, and fire. So let us model our platform narration, as our other forms of speech, upon the effective addresses of the moderns, without lessening our admiration for the older school. The Anecdote An anecdote is a short narrative of a single event, told as being striking enough to bring out a point. The keener the point, the more condensed the form, and the more suddenly the application strikes the hearer, the better the story. 
to regard an anecdote as an illustration an interpretive picture will help to hold us to its true purpose for a purposeless story is of all offences on the platform the most asinine a perfectly capital joke will fall flat when it is dragged in by the nape without evident bearing on the subject under discussion on the other hand an apposite anecdote has saved many a speech from failure Quote, there is no finer opportunity for the display of tact than in the introduction of witty or humorous stories into a discourse wit is keen and like a rapier piercing deeply sometimes even to the heart humor is good-natured and does not wound wit is founded upon the sudden discovery of an unsuspected relation existing between two ideas humor deals with things out of relation with the incongruous it was wit in douglas gerald to retort upon the scowl of a stranger whose shoulder he had familiarly slapped mistaking him for a friend quote, i beg your pardon i thought i knew you but i'm glad i don't End quote. it was humor in the southern orator john wise to liken the pleasure of spending an evening with a puritan girl to that of sitting on a block of ice in winter cracking hailstones between his teeth End quote. the foregoing quotation has been introduced chiefly to illustrate the first and simplest form of anecdote the single sentence embodying a pungent saying another simple form is that which conveys its meaning without need of application as the old preachers used to say george ade has quoted this one as the best joke he ever heard two solemn-looking gentlemen were riding together in a railway carriage one gentleman said to the other is your wife entertaining this summer whereupon the other gentleman replied not very other anecdotes need harnessing to the particular truth the speaker wishes to carry along in his talk sometimes the application is made before the story is told and the audience is prepared to make the comparison point by point as the illustration is told henry w grady used this method in one of the anecdotes he told while delivering his great extemporaneous address the new south age does not endow all things with strength and virtue nor are all new things to be despised the shoemaker who put over his door john smith's shop founded seventeen sixty was more than matched by his young rival across the street who hung out this sign bill jones established eighteen eighty six no old stock kept in this shop in two anecdotes told also in the new south mr grady illustrated another way of enforcing the application in both instances he split the idea he wished to drive home bringing in part before and part after the recital of the story the fact that the speaker misquoted the words of genesis in which the ark is described did not seem to detract from the burlesque humor of the story i bespake the utmost stretch of your courtesy to-night i am not troubled about those from whom i come you remember the man whose wife sent him to a neighbor with a pitcher of milk who tripping on the top step fell with such casual interruptions as the landings afforded into the basement and while picking himself up had the pleasure of hearing his wife call out john did you break the pitcher no i didn't said john but i be dinged if i don't so while those who call to me from behind may inspire me with energy if not with courage i ask an indulgent hearing from you i beg that you will bring your full faith in american fairness and frankness to judgment upon what i shall say there was an old preacher once who told some boys of the bible lesson he was going to read in the morning the boys finding the place glued together the connecting pages the next morning he read on the bottom of one page when noah was one hundred and twenty years old he took unto himself a wife 
who was, then turning the page, 140 cubits long, 40 cubits wide, built of gopher wood and covered with pitch inside and out. He was naturally puzzled at this. He read it again, verified it, and then said, My friends, this is the first time I ever met this in the Bible, but I accept it as an evidence of the assertion that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. If I could get you to hold such faith tonight, I could proceed cheerfully to the task I otherwise approach with a sense of consecration. Now and then a speaker will plunge without introduction into an anecdote, leaving the application to follow. The following illustrates this method. A large, slew-footed darkey was leaning against the corner of the railroad station in a Texas town when the noon whistle in the canning factory blew and the hands hurried out, bearing their grub buckets. The darkey listened, with his head on one side, until the rocketing echo had quite died away. Then he heaved a deep sigh and remarked to himself, "'There she go. Dinner time for some folks, but just twelve o'clock for me.' That is the situation in thousands of American factories, large and small, today. And why? Etc. Etc. Doubtless, the most frequent platform use of the anecdote is in the pulpit. The sermon illustration, however, is not always strictly narrative in form, but tends to extended comparison as the following from Dr. Alexander McLaren. Men will stand as Indian fakirs do, with their arms above their heads until they stiffen there. They will perch themselves upon pillars like Simeon stylites for years till the birds build their nests in their hair. They will measure all the distance from Cape Comoran to Juggernaut's temple with their bodies along the dusty road. They will wear hair shirts and scourge themselves. They will fast and deny themselves. They will build cathedrals and endow churches. They will do as many of you do, labor by fits and starts all through your lives at the endless task of making yourselves ready for heaven and winning it by obedience and by righteousness. They will do all these things and do them gladly, rather than listen to the humbling message that says, You do not need to do anything. Wash. Is it your washing or the water that will clean you? Wash and be clean. Naaman's cleaning was only a test of his obedience, and a token that it was God who cleansed him. There was no power in Jordan's waters to take away the taint of leprosy. Our cleansing is in that blood of Jesus Christ that has the power to take away all sin and to make the foulest among us pure and clean. One final word must be said about the introduction to the anecdote. A clumsy, inappropriate introduction is fatal, whereas a single apt or witty sentence will kindle interest and prepare a favorable hearing. The following extreme illustration by the English humorist Captain Harry Graham well satirizes the stumbling manner. The best story that I ever heard was one that I was told once in the fall of 1905, or it may have been 1906, when I was visiting Boston. At least I think it was Boston. It may have been Washington. My memory is so bad. I happened to run across a most amusing man whose name I forget, Williams or Wilson or Wilkins, some name like that, and he told me this story while we were waiting for a trolley car. I can still remember how heartily I laughed at the time, and again that evening, after I had gone to bed, how I laughed myself to sleep, recalling the humor of this incredibly humorous story. It was really quite extraordinarily funny. In fact, I can truthfully affirm that it is quite the most amusing story that I have ever had the privilege of hearing. Unfortunately, I have forgotten it. Biographical Facts Public speaking has much to do with personalities. 
Naturally, therefore, the narration of a series of biographical details, including anecdotes among the recital of interesting facts, plays a large part in the eulogy, the memorial address, the political speech, the sermon, the lecture, and other platform deliverances. Whole addresses may be made up of such biographical details, such as a sermon on Moses or a lecture on Lee. The following example is in itself an expanded anecdote, forming a link in a chain. Marius in Prison the peculiar sublimity of the roman mind does not express itself nor is it at all to be sought in their poetry poetry according to the roman ideal of it was not an adequate organ for the grander movements of the national mind roman sublimity must be looked for in roman acts and in roman sayings where again will you find a more adequate expression of the roman majesty than in the saying of trajan imperatorem oportere stantem mori that caesar ought to die standing a speech of imperatorial grandeur implying that he who was the foremost man of all this world and in regard to all other nations the representative of his own should express its characteristic virtue in his farewell act should die in procinctu and should meet the last enemy as the first with a roman countenance and in a soldier's attitude if this had an imperatorial what follows had a consular majesty and is almost the grandest story upon record marius the man who rose to be seven times consul was in a dungeon and a slave was sent in with commission to put him to death these were the persons the two extremities of exalted and forlorn humanity its vanward and its rearward man a roman consul and an abject slave but their natural relations to each other were by the caprice of fortune monstrously inverted the consul was in chains the slave was for a moment the arbiter of his fate by what spells what magic did marius reinstate himself in his natural prerogatives by what marvels drawn from heaven or from earth did he in the twinkling of an eye again invest himself with the purple and place between himself and his assassin a host of shadowy lictors by the mere blank supremacy of great minds over weak ones he fascinated the slave as a rattlesnake does a bird standing like tenerife he smote him with his eye and said tune homo aures occidere gaius marium dost thou fellow presume to kill gaius marius whereat the reptile quaking under the voice nor daring to affront the consular eye sank gently to the ground turned round upon his hands and feet and crawling out of the prison like any other vermin left marius standing in solitude as steadfast and immovable as the capital thomas de quincey here is a similar example prefaced by a general historical statement and concluding with autobiographical details a reminiscence of lexington one raw morning in spring it will be eighty years the nineteenth day of this month hancock and adams the moses and aaron of that great deliverance were both at lexington they also had obstructed an officer with brave words british soldiers a thousand strong came to seize them and carry them over sea for trial and so nipped the bud of freedom auspiciously opening in that early spring the town militia came together before daylight for training a great tall man with a large head and a high wide brow their captain one who had seen service marshalled them into line numbering but seventy and bade every man load his piece with powder and ball i will order the first man shot that runs away said he when some faltered don't fire unless fired upon but if they want to have a war let it begin here 
Gentlemen, you know what followed. Those farmers and mechanics fired the shot heard round the world. A little monument covers the bones of such as before had pledged their fortune and their sacred honor to the freedom of America, and that day gave it also their lives. I was born in that little town and bred up amid the memories of that day. When a boy, my mother lifted me up one Sunday in her religious, patriotic arms and held me while I read the first monumental line I ever saw, Sacred to Liberty and the Rights of Mankind. Since then I have studied the memorial marbles of Greece and Rome in many an ancient town, nay, on Egyptian obelisks have read what was written before the Eternal raised up Moses to lead Israel out of Egypt, but no chiseled stone has ever stirred me to such emotion as these rustic names of men who fell in the sacred cause of God and their country. Gentlemen, the spirit of liberty, the love of justice, were early fanned into a flame in my boyish heart. That monument covers the bones of my own kinsfolk. It was their blood which reddened the long green grass at Lexington. It was my own name which stands chiseled on that stone, the tall captain who marshalled his fellow farmers and mechanics into stern array and spoke such brave and dangerous words as opened the war of American independence, the last to leave the field, was my father's father. I learned to read out of his Bible, and with a musket he that day captured from the foe, I learned another religious lesson, that rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. I kept them both, sacred to liberty and the rights of mankind, to use them both in the sacred cause of God and my country. Theodore Parker narration of events in general in this wider emancipated narration we find much mingling of other forms of discourse greatly to the advantage of the speech for this truth cannot be too strongly emphasized the efficient speaker cuts loose from form for the sake of a big free effect the present analyses are for no other purpose than to acquaint you with form do not allow any such models to hang as a weight about your neck. The following pure narration of events from George William Curtis's Paul Revere's Ride varies the biographical recital in other parts of his famous oration. That evening, at ten o'clock, 800 British troops under Lieutenant Colonel Smith took boat at the foot of the common and crossed to the Cambridge shore. Gage thought his secret had been kept, but Lord Percy, who had heard the people say on the common that the troops would miss their aim, undeceived him. Gage instantly ordered that no one should leave the town. But as the troops crossed the river, Ebenezer Dorr, with a message to Hancock and Adams, was riding over the neck to Roxbury, and Paul Revere was rowing over the river to Charlestown, having agreed with his friend Robert Newman to show lanterns from the belfry of the Old North Church, one if by land and two if by sea, as a signal of the march of the British. The following from the same oration beautifully mingles description with narration. It was a brilliant night. The winter had been unusually mild and the spring very forward. The hills were already green. The early grain waved in the fields and the air was sweet with the blossoming orchards. Already the robins whistled, the bluebirds sang and the benediction of peace rested upon the landscape. Under the cloudless moon the soldiers silently marched and Paul Revere swiftly rode galloping through Medford and West Cambridge, rousing every house as he went spurring for Lexington and Hancock and Adams, and evading the British patrols who had been sent out to stop the news. In the succeeding extract from another of Mr. Curtis's addresses, we have a free use of allegory as illustration. 
the leadership of educated men there is a modern english picture which the genius of hawthorne might have inspired the painter calls it how they met themselves a man and a woman haggard and weary wandering lost in a sombre wood suddenly meet the shadowy figures of a youth and a maid some mysterious fascination fixes the gaze and stills the hearts of the wanderers and their amazement deepens into awe as they gradually recognize themselves as once they were the soft bloom of youth upon their rounded cheeks the dewy light of hope in their trusting eyes exulting confidence in their springing step themselves blithe and radiant with the glory of the dawn to-day and here we meet ourselves not to these familiar scenes alone yonder college green with its reverent traditions the halcyon cove of the seekonk upon which the memory of roger williams broods like a bird of calm the historic bay beating forever with the muffled oars of barton and of abraham whipple here the humming city of the living there the peaceful city of the dead not to these only or chiefly do we return but to ourselves as we once were it is not the smiling freshmen of the year it is your own beardless and unwrinkled faces that are looking from the windows of university hall and of hope college under the trees upon the hill it is yourselves whom you see walking full of hopes and dreams glowing with conscious power and nourishing a youth sublime and in this familiar temple which surely has never echoed with eloquence so fervid and inspiring as that of your commencement orations it is not yonder youths in the galleries who as they fondly believe are whispering to yonder maids it is your younger selves who in the days that are no more are murmuring to the fairest mothers and grandmothers of those maids happy the worn and weary man and woman in the picture could they have felt their older eyes still glistening with that earlier light and their hearts yet beating with undiminished sympathy and aspiration happy we brethren whatever may have been achieved whatever left undone if returning to the home of our earlier years we bring with us the illimitable hope the unchilled resolution the inextinguishable faith of youth george william curtis questions and exercises one clip from any source ten anecdotes and state what truths they may be used to illustrate two deliver five of these in your own language without making any application three from the ten deliver one so as to make the application before telling the anecdote four deliver another so as to split the application five deliver another so as to make the application after the narration six deliver another in such a way as to make a specific application needless seven give three ways of introducing an anecdote by saying where you heard it etc eight deliver an illustration that is not strictly an anecdote in the style of curtis's speech on page two five nine nine deliver an address on any public character using the forms illustrated in this chapter ten deliver an address on some historical event in the same manner eleven explain how the sympathies and viewpoint of the speaker will color an anecdote a biography or a historical account twelve illustrate how the same anecdote or a section of a historical address may be given two different effects by personal prejudice thirteen what would be the effect of shifting the viewpoint in the midst of a narration 
14. What is the danger of using too much humor in an address? Too much pathos. End of section 21. Two of the art of public speaking this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by avai in december 2010 the art of public speaking by dale carnegie and joseph burke Asenwein. chapter 22 influencing by suggestion sometimes the feeling that a given way of looking at things is undoubtedly correct prevents the mind from thinking at all in view of the hindrances which certain kinds or degrees of feeling throw into the way of thinking it might be inferred that the thinker must suppress the element of feeling in the inner life no greater mistake could be made if the creator endowed man with the power to think to feel and to will these several activities of the mind are not designed to be in conflict and so long as any one of them is not perverted or allowed to run to excess it necessarily aids and strengthens the others in their normal functions nathan c sheffer thinking and learning to think when we weigh compare and decide upon the value of any given ideas we reason when an idea produces in us an opinion or an action without first being subjected to deliberation we are moved by suggestion man was formerly thought to be a reasoning animal basing his actions on the conclusions of natural logic it was supposed that before forming an opinion or deciding on a course of conduct he weighed at least some of the reasons for and against the matter and performed a more or less simple process of reasoning but modern research has shown that quite the opposite is true most of our opinions and actions are not based upon conscious reasoning but are the result of suggestion in fact some authorities declare that an act of pure reasoning is very rare in the average mind momentous decisions are made far-reaching actions are determined upon primarily by the force of suggestion notice that word primarily for simple thought and even mature reasoning often follows a suggestion accepted in the mind and the thinker fondly supposes that his conclusion is from first to last based on cold logic the basis of suggestion we must think of suggestion both as an effect and as a cause considered as an effect or objectively there must be something in the hearer that predisposes him to receive suggestion considered as a cause or subjectively there must be some methods by which the speaker can move upon that particularly susceptible attitude of the hearer how to do this honestly and fairly is our problem to do it dishonestly and trickily to use suggestion to bring about conviction and action without a basis of right and truth and in a bad cause is to assume the terrible responsibility that must fall on the champion of error jesus scorned not to use suggestion so that he might move men to their benefit but every vicious trickster has adopted the same means to reach base ends therefore honest men will examine well into their motives and into the truth of their cause before seeking to influence men by suggestion three fundamental conditions make us all susceptive to suggestion we naturally respect authority in every mind this is only a question of degree ranging from the subject who is easily hypnotized to the stubborn mind that fortifies itself the more strongly with every assault upon its opinion the latter type is almost immune to suggestion one of the singular things about suggestion is that it is rarely a fixed quantity 
the mind that is receptive to the authority of a certain person may prove inflexible to another moods and environments that produce hypnosis readily in one instance may be entirely inoperative in another and some minds can scarcely ever be thus moved we do know however that the feeling of the subject that authority influence power domination control whatever you wish to call it lies in the person of the suggestor is the basis of all suggestion the extreme force of this influence is demonstrated in hypnotism the hypnotic subject is told that he is in the water he accepts the statement as true and makes swimming motions he is told that a band is marching down the street playing the star-spangled banner he declares he hears the music arises and stands with head bared in the same way some speakers are able to achieve a modified hypnotic effect upon their audiences the hearers will applaud measures and ideas which after individual reflection they will repudiate unless such reflection brings the conviction that the first impression is correct a second important principle is that our feelings thoughts and wills tend to follow the line of least resistance once open the mind to the sway of one feeling and it requires a greater power of feeling thought or will or even all three to unseat it our feelings influence our judgments and volitions much more than we care to admit so true is this that it is a superhuman task to get an audience to reason fairly on a subject on which it feels deeply and when this result is accomplished the success becomes noteworthy as in the case of henry ward beecher's liverpool speech emotional ideas once accepted are soon cherished and finally become our very inmost selves attitudes based on feelings alone are prejudices what is true of our feelings in this respect applies to our ideas all thoughts that enter the mind tend to be accepted as truth unless a stronger and contradictory thought arises the speaker skilled in moving men to action manages to dominate the minds of his audience with his thoughts by subtly prohibiting the entertaining of ideas hostile to his own most of us are captured by the latest strong attack and if we can be induced to act while under the stress of that last insistent thought we lose sight of counter influences the fact is that almost all our decisions if they involve thought at all are of this sort at the moment of decision the course of action then under contemplation usurps the attention and conflicting ideas are dropped out of consideration the head of a large publishing house remarked only recently that ninety per cent of the people who bought books by subscription never read them they buy because the salesman presents his wares so skillfully that every consideration but the attractiveness of the book drops out of the mind and that thought prompts action every idea that enters the mind will result in action unless a contradictory thought arises to prohibit it think of singing the musical scale and it will result in your singing it unless the counter thought of its futility or absurdity inhibits your action if you bandage and doctor a horse's foot he will go lame you cannot think of swallowing without the muscles used in that process being affected you cannot think of saying hello without a slight movement of the muscles of speech to warn children that they should not put beans up their noses is the surest method of getting them to do it every thought called up in the mind of your audience will work either for or against you thoughts are not dead matter they radiate dynamic energy the thoughts all tend to pass into action thought is another name for fate dominate your hearers thoughts allay all contradictory ideas and you will sway them as you wish volitions as well as feelings and thoughts tend to follow the line of least resistance that is what makes habit 
suggests to a man that it is impossible to change his mind, and in most cases it becomes more difficult to do so. The exception is the man who naturally jumps to the contrary. Counter-suggestion is the only way to reach him. Suggest subtly and persistently that the opinions of those in the audience who are opposed to your views are changing, and it requires an effort of the will, in fact, a summoning of the forces of feeling, thought, and will, to stem the tide of change that has subconsciously set in. But not only are we moved by authority and tend toward channels of least resistance, we are all influenced by our environments. It is difficult to rise above the sway of a crowd, its enthusiasms and its fears are contagious because they are suggestive. What so many feel, we say to ourselves, must have some basis in truth. Ten times ten makes more than one hundred. Set ten men to speaking to ten audiences of ten men each, and compare the aggregate power of those ten speakers with that of one man addressing one hundred men. The ten speakers may be more logically convincing than the single orator, but the chances are strongly in favor of the one man's reaching a greater total effect, for the hundred men will radiate conviction and resolution as ten small groups could not. We all know the truism about the enthusiasm of numbers. See the chapter on Influencing the Crowd. Environment controls us unless the contrary is strongly suggested. A gloomy day in a drab room, sparsely tenanted by listeners, invites platform disaster. Everyone feels it in the air. But let the speaker walk squarely up to the issue and suggest by all his feeling, manner and words that this is going to be a great gathering in every vital sense, and see how the suggestive power of environment recedes before the advance of a more potent suggestion, if such the speaker is able to make it. Now these three factors, respect for authority, tendency to follow lines of least resistance, and susceptibility to environment, all help to bring the auditor into a state of mind favorable to suggestive influences, but they also react on the speaker, and now we must consider those personally causative or subjective forces which enable him to use suggestion effectively. How the speaker can make suggestion effective. We have seen that under the influence of authoritative suggestion, the audience is inclined to accept the speaker's assertion without argument and criticism. But the audience is not in this state of mind unless it has implicit confidence in the speaker. If they lack faith in him, question his motives or knowledge, or even object to his manner, they will not be moved by his most logical conclusion, and will fail to give him a just hearing. It is all a matter of their confidence in him. Whether the speaker finds it already in the warm, expectant look of his hearers, or must win to it against opposition or coldness, he must gain that one great vantage point before his suggestions take on power in the hearts of his listeners. Confidence is the mother of conviction. Note in the opening of Henry W. Grady's after-dinner speech how he attempted to secure the confidence of his audience. He created a receptive atmosphere by a humorous story, expressed his desire to speak with earnestness and sincerity, acknowledged the vast interests involved, deprecated his untried arm, and professed his humility. Would not such an introduction give you confidence in the speaker unless you were strongly opposed to him? And even then, would it not partly disarm your antagonism? Mr. President, bidden by your invitation to a discussion of the race problem, forbidden by occasion to make a political speech, I appreciate in trying to reconcile orders with propriety, the perplexity of the little maid, who, bidden to learn to swim, was yet adjured. Now, go, my darling, hang your clothes on a hickory limb, and don't go near the water. 
the stoutest apostle of the church they say is the missionary and the missionary wherever he unfurls his flag will never find himself in deeper need of unction and address than i bidden to-night to plant the standard of a southern democrat in boston's banquet hall and to discuss the problem of the races in the home of phillips and of sumner but mr president if a purpose to speak in perfect frankness and sincerity if earnest understanding of the vast interests involved if a consecrating sense of what disaster may follow further misunderstanding and estrangement if these may be counted to steady undisciplined speech and to strengthen an untried arm then sir i shall find the courage to proceed note also mr bryan's attempt to secure the confidence of his audience in the following introduction to his cross of gold speech delivered before the national democratic convention in chicago eighteen ninety six he asserts his own inability to oppose the distinguished gentleman he maintains the holiness of his cause and he declares that he will speak in the interest of humanity well knowing that humanity is likely to have confidence in the champion of their rights this introduction completely dominated the audience and the speech made mr bryan famous mr chairman and gentlemen of the convention i would be presumptuous indeed to present myself against the distinguished gentleman to whom you have listened if this were a mere measuring of abilities but this is not a contest between persons the humblest citizen in all the land when clad in the armour of a righteous cause is stronger than all the hosts of error i come to speak to you in defence of a cause as holy as the cause of liberty the cause of humanity some speakers are able to beget confidence by their very manner while others cannot to secure confidence be confident how can you expect others to accept a message in which you lack or seem to lack faith yourself confidence is as contagious as disease napoleon rebuked an officer for using the word impossible in his presence the speaker who will entertain no idea of defeat begets in his hearers the idea of his victory lady macbeth was so confident of success that macbeth changed his mind about undertaking the assassination columbus was so certain in his mission that queen isabella pawned her jewels to finance his expedition assert your message with implicit assurance and your own belief will act as so much gunpowder to drive it home advertisers have long utilized this principle the machine you will eventually buy ask the man who owns one has the strength of gibraltar are publicity slogans so full of confidence that they give birth to confidence in the mind of the reader it should but may not go without saying that confidence must have a solid ground of merit or there will be a ridiculous crash it is all very well for the spellbinder to claim all the precincts the official count is just ahead the reaction against overconfidence and oversuggestion ought to warn those whose chief asset is mere bluff a short time ago a speaker arose in a public speaking club and asserted that grass would spring from wood ashes sprinkled over the soil without the aid of seed this idea was greeted with a laugh but the speaker was so sure of his position that he reiterated the statement forcefully several times and cited his own personal experience as proof one of the most intelligent men in the audience who at first had derided the idea at length came to believe in it when asked the reason for his sudden change of attitude he replied because the speaker is so confident in fact he was so confident that it took a letter from the u s department of agriculture to dislodge his error 
if by a speaker's confidence intelligent men can be made to believe such preposterous theories as this where will the power of self-reliance cease when plausible propositions are under consideration advanced with all the power of convincing speech note the utter assurance in these selections i know not what course others may take but as for me give me liberty or give me death patrick henry i ne'er will ask you quarter and i ne'er will be your slave but i'll swim the sea of slaughter till i sink beneath its wave Patton. come one come all this rock shall fly from its firm base as soon as i sir walter scott invictus out of the night that covers me black as the pit from pole to pole i thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul in the fell clutch of circumstance i have not winced nor cried aloud under the bludgeonings of chance my head is bloody but unbowed beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid it matters not how straight the gate how charged with punishments to scroll i am the master of my fate i am the captain of my soul william ernest henley authority is a factor in suggestion we generally accept as truth and without criticism the words of an authority when he speaks contradictory ideas rarely arise in the mind to inhibit the action he suggests a judge of the supreme court has the power of his words multiplied by the virtue of his position the ideas of the u s commissioner of immigration on his subject are much more effective and powerful than those of a soap manufacturer though the latter may be an able economist this principle also has been used in advertising we are told that the physicians to two kings have recommended sanatogen we are informed that the largest bank in america tiffany and co and the state war and navy departments all use the encyclopedia britannica the shrewd promoter gives stock in his company to influential bankers or businessmen in the community in order that he may use their examples as a selling argument if you wish to influence your audience through suggestion if you would have your statements accepted without criticism or argument you should appear in the light of an authority and be one ignorance and credulity will remain unchanged unless the suggestion of authority be followed promptly by facts don't claim authority unless you carry your license in your pocket let reason support the position that suggestion has assumed advertising will help to establish your reputation it is up to you to maintain it one speaker found that his reputation as magazine writer was a splendid asset as a speaker mr bryan's publicity gained by three nominations for the presidency and his position as secretary of state helps him to command large sums as a speaker but back of it all he is a great speaker newspaper announcements all kinds of advertising formality impressive introductions all have the capital effect on the attitude of the audience but how ridiculous are all these if a toy pistol is advertised as a sixteen-inch gun note how authority is used in the following to support the strength of the speaker's appeal professor alfred russell wallace has just celebrated his ninetieth birthday sharing with charles darwin the honor of discovering evolution professor wallace has lately received many and signal honors from scientific societies at the dinner given him in london his address was largely made up of reminiscences he reviewed the progress of civilization during the last century and made a series of brilliant and startling contrasts between the england of eighteen thirteen and the world of nineteen thirteen he affirmed that our progress is only seeming and not real 
Professor Wallace insists that the painters, the sculptors, the architects of Athens and Rome were so superior to the modern men that the very fragments of their marbles and temples are the despair of the present-day artists. He tells us that man has improved his telescope and spectacles, but that he is losing his eyesight, that man is improving his looms, but stiffening his fingers, improving his automobile and his locomotive, but losing his legs, improving his foods, but losing his digestion. He adds that the modern white slave traffic, orphan asylums and tenement house life in factory towns, make a black page in the history of the twentieth century. Professor Wallace's views are reinforced by the report of the Commission of Parliament on the causes of the deterioration of the factory class people. In our own country, Professor Jordan warns us against war, intemperance, overworking, underfeeding of poor children, and disturbs our contentment with his harvest of blood. Professor Jenks is more pessimistic. He thinks that the pace, the climate, and the stress of city life have broken down the Puritan stock, that in another century our old families will be extinct, and that the flood of immigration means a Niagara of muddy waters fouling the pure springs of American life. In his address in New Haven, Professor Kellogg calls the role of the science of race degeneracy and tells us that this deterioration even indicates a trend toward race extinction. Ewell Dwight Hillis From every side come warnings to the American people. Our medical journals are filled with danger signals. New books and magazines, fresh from the press, tell us plainly that our people are fronting a social crisis. Mr. Jefferson, who was once regarded as good democratic authority, seems to have differed in opinion from the gentleman who has addressed us on the part of the minority. Those who are opposed to this proposition tell us that the issue of the paper money is a function of the bank, and that the government ought to go out of the banking business. I stand with Jefferson rather than with them, and tell them, as he did, that the issue of money is a function of government and that the banks ought to go out of the governing business. William Jennings Bryan Authority is the great weapon against doubt, for even its force can rarely prevail against prejudice and persistent wrong-headedness. If any speaker has been able to forge a sword that is warranted to piece such armor, let him bless humanity by sharing his secret with his platform brethren everywhere, for thus far he is alone in his glory. There is a middle ground between the suggestion of authority and the confession of weakness that offers a wide range for tact in the speaker. No one can advise you when to throw your hat in the ring and say defiantly at the outstart, Gentlemen, I am here to fight. Theodore Roosevelt can do that. Beecher would have been mobbed if he had begun in that style at Liverpool. It is for your own tact to decide whether you will use the disarming grace of Henry W. Grady's introduction just quoted. Even the time-worn joke was ingenious and seemed to say, Gentlemen, I come to you with no carefully palmed coins. Or whether the solemn gravity of Mr. Bryan before the convention will prove to be more effective. Only be sure that your opening attitude is well thought out, and if it change as you warm up to your subject, let not the change lay you open to a revulsion of feeling in your audience. Example is a powerful means of suggestion. As we saw while thinking of environment in its effects on an audience, we do, without the usual amount of hesitation and criticism, what others are doing. Paris wears certain hats and gowns, the rest of the world imitates. The child mimics the action, accents, and intonations of the parent. Were a child never to hear anyone speak, he would never acquire the power of speech, unless under most arduous training, and even then only imperfectly. One of the biggest department stores in the United States spends fortunes on one advertising slogan. Everybody is going to the big store. That makes everybody want to go. 
you can reinforce the power of your message by showing that it has been widely accepted political organizations subsidize applause to create the impression that their speakers ideas are warmly received and approved by the audience the advocates of the commission form of government of cities the champions of votes for women reserve as their strongest arguments the fact that a number of cities and states have already successfully accepted their plans advertisements use the testimonial for its power of suggestion observe how this principle has been applied in the following selections and utilize it on every occasion possible in your attempts to influence through suggestion the war is actually begun the next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms our brethren are already in the field why stand ye here idle patrick henry with a zeal approaching the zeal which inspired the crusaders who followed peter the hermit our silver democrats went forth from victory unto victory until they are now assembled not to discuss not to debate but to enter up the judgment already rendered by the plain people of this country in this contest the brother has been arrayed against brother father against son the warmest ties of love acquaintance and association have been disregarded old leaders have been cast aside when they refused to give expression to the sentiments of those whom they would lead and new leaders have sprung up to give direction to this cause of truth thus has the contest been waged and we have assembled here under as binding and solemn instructions as were ever imposed upon representatives of the people william jennings bryan figurative and indirect language has suggestive force because it does not make statements that can be directly disputed it arouses no contradictory ideas in the minds of the audience thereby fulfilling one of the basic requisites of suggestion by implying a conclusion in indirect or figurative language it is often asserted more forcefully note that in the following mr bryan did not say that mr mckinley would be defeated he implied it in a much more effective manner mr mckinley was nominated at st louis upon a platform which declared for the maintenance of the gold standard until it can be changed into bimetallism by international agreement mr mckinley was the most popular man among the republicans and three months ago everybody in the republican party prophesied his election how is it today why the man who was once pleased to think that he looked like napoleon that man shudders today when he remembers that he was nominated on the anniversary of the battle of waterloo not only that but as he listens he can hear with ever-increasing distinctness the sound of the waves as they beat upon the lonely shores of st helena had thomas carlyle said a false man cannot found a religion his words would have been neither so suggestive nor so powerful nor so long remembered as his implication in these striking words a false man found a religion why a false man cannot build a brick house if he does not know and follow truly the properties of mortar burnt clay and what else he works in it is no house that he makes but a rubbish heap it will not stand for twelve centuries to lodge a hundred and eighty millions it will fall straight away a man must conform himself to nature's laws be verily in communication with nature and the truth of things or nature will answer him no not at all observe how the picture that webster draws here is much more emphatic and forceful than any mere assertion could be sir i know not how others may feel but as for myself when i see my alma mater surrounded like caesar in the senate house by those who are reiterating stab after stab i would not for this right hand have her turn to me and say and thou too my son webster 
a speech should be built on sound logical foundations and no man should dare to speak in behalf of a fallacy arguing a subject however will necessarily arouse contradictory ideas in the mind of your audience when immediate action or persuasion is desired suggestion is more efficacious than argument when both are judiciously mixed the effect is irresistible questions and exercises one make an outline or brief of the contents of this chapter two revise the introduction to any of your written addresses with the teachings of this chapter in mind three give two original examples of the power of suggestion as you have observed it in each of these fields a advertising b politics c public sentiment four give original examples of suggestive speech illustrating two of the principles set forth in this chapter five what reasons can you give that disprove the general contention of this chapter six what reasons not already given seem to you to support it seven what effect do his own suggestions have on the speaker himself eight can suggestion arise from the audience if so show how nine select two instances of suggestion in the speeches found in the appendix ten change any two passages in the same or other speeches so as to use suggestion more effectively eleven deliver those passages in the revised form twelve choosing your own subject prepare and deliver a short speech largely in the suggestive style end of section twenty two